The campus of Pyongyang University of Science and Technology had a guardhouse and a gate. And the only times we were allowed to leave were during group outings, either to go sightseeing or grocery shopping. We were always accompanied by people called minders, whose job was to watch us and make sure we did nothing unauthorized. The sites themselves were the standard attractions that the regime allowed foreigners to see, whether it was a mountain or a museum or a fruit farm or a subway, everything ran according to a script. And the script was always focused on the great leader, either Kim Jong-il or Kim Il-sung. It was during these outings that I slowly came to understand how the country really functioned. There were hardly any cars on the highways, and we often stopped at checkpoints. Occasionally, though, I would see children sitting directly on the pavement or people walking aimlessly along the side of the highway. Long stretches of barren landscape would be interrupted by clusters of identical-looking houses, always against the backdrop of a huge Great Leader mural and a tower that looked like a miniature version of the Juche Tower in Pyongyang. The checkpoints divided the towns, and there was no means of communication among them. But each town was an exact replica of the one before and the one after. It dawned on me then that this must be why we sometimes saw children sitting in the middle of the highway, because there was nowhere for them to go. It was the closest thing to a playground or public square. It was also the only place where they saw evidence of the outside world. Even though it looked to me as though they were sitting in the middle of nowhere, I realized that they must sit there to feel connected. It made me feel so vividly what a claustrophobic and dehumanizing country North Korea is.